Okay, so what do I mean by a supplemental story? Well, basically, that means any part of the media that isn't canon inside of the show proper. The soundtracks are great, but not all of the songs make it into the show, so it's considered a supplemental piece of the media. You don't need to watch Mewtwo Strikes Back in order to follow the story of the Pokemon anime. Supplemental material don't affect the plot proper. And Ruby actually started with supplemental stories. All four of the original trailers are their own one-off stories that don't affect the viewer if they don't watch them. You can dive right into the show proper without watching those trailers and still totally understand everything. The most the trailers tell the audience that relates to the show proper is why Junior's men are nervous around Yang and how Blake left Adam. These interactions are fun to see, but the show still stands fine on its own if you never watch them. Junior is a very minor character, so knowing his past with Yang isn't all that important, and Blake helps establish who Adam is and her rocky relationship with him through dialogue. Now, I want to make something very clear. Supplemental stories are not a bad thing. It's actually a very good thing. Supplemental stories are a great way to let the writers play around without having them feel tied down to the plot. If Miles and Carrie wanted to tell a little one-off story about Ruby and Weiss going clothes shopping, they could just make it into another trailer or character short. And of course, the trailers aren't their only things they use to support these supplemental stories. Ruby's World of Remnants is a great use of a supplemental platform to give deeper lore. All the important stuff you need to know is still in the show, but if you're hungry for a deeper explanation, then the World of Remnants are right up your alley. It's a good way for the writers to be able to tell the audience more about the mechanics, lore, or setting without having to bog down the show proper with exposition dumps. Ruby now has an impressive selection of manga. They have fun one-off stories of Team Ruby and Juniper getting into fun, wacky situations with each other. The personalities get to bounce off one another and their antics aren't being bogged down by having to connect to the overarching plot. And the Shonen Jump manga is a supplemental retelling of the story. Trimming things, changing things, seeing new different interactions between characters, it's a fun reinterpretation of the show. If you love these characters and want to see them on much more lighthearted shenanigans than where the show has currently gotten to, then getting these manga is the exact thing for you. And they're diving into the world of novels too. The new coffee book is the first of, hopefully, many written formats to dive into supplemental material. Even better, they're using these supplemental materials to get a better look at some of the minor characters. This could mean all those one-off characters we fell in love with in the early volumes of the show has a chance to come back, without having to be forced into the plot. I fell in love with Team Coffee, and while I know they probably won't show back up in the show proper, I can still get to spend time with these characters, especially Coco, because I love her, and she's the best, and a badass, and Coco is best girl. Fight me. Ruby's also diving into the video game market. Not only can we see Team Ruby in fun appearances in Blaze Blue, but their own Amity Arena mobile game is great. It brings back characters who never got a bunch of screen time but fans still fell in love with, and adds a little character description to them to give more depth than they never got in the show. So obviously, supplemental material can be great, both for the creators of the show and the consumers. But there is a slippery slope when it comes to that kind of thing. First is something we can see in the Blake character short for Volume 5. It's fine as it is, it's just a simple story of Blake and Son hunting down a bad guy while Blake remembers a conversation she had with Ilya. The problem is, the important things about Ilya we learned in that trailer don't end up being talked about in the show proper. Ilya's parents were killed in a dust mine accident, and the people she thought were her friends laughed. She had been hiding as a human in Atlas, but in that moment she couldn't handle it anymore, and revealed her true self as she beat the girls laughing at her parents' demise. It's a brutal life she's had to live, and understanding her anger and frustrations make her actions in Volume 5 hold deeper meanings. Ilya plays a major role in the volume. She's Blake's main adversary, attempting to kidnap her and kill her parents, while simultaneously second-guessing the Albane brothers and ultimately siding with Blake. But she only briefly mentions her parents' death. Without watching the character short, you would be left in the dark for what motivates Ilya's actions. In the show, we only see how Ilya's love for Blake plays a role in making her switch sides, but we have no idea why she's doing villainous things against Blake in the first place. Having a greater understanding about that racism she suffered and the anger that fuels her makes her actions make sense. She solved the problems of her past by getting angry, hurting others, instilling fear in those who might laugh at her misfortune. Without understanding her story, Ilya's motivations seem backwards. If she cares so much about Blake, why not side with her right from the beginning? Sometimes it feels like the Ruby crew almost expects you to consume all the supplemental materials. Bumblebee makes sense, you just need to listen to the soundtrack first. Weiss's family has been explored, you just need to read the manga first. And I don't want to have to watch every behind the scenes video or buy all the manga or get all the DVDs just to understand something that should be established in the show proper. Worst of all, I get the sinking feeling that if they say something at a convention, they assume they don't need to bother saying it anywhere in the show. 
Like, apparently at some Q&A panel or something, they explain Crow uses his scythe so rarely because he only uses it against Grimm. It's too slow against people. A, that's not true at all. He uses it against Cordo's mech, and he starts to deploy it against Winter and Hazel. B, if that is his philosophy, why hasn't he said anything about this during the show proper? I get it. Panels and Q&As bring up questions the fans want to know. But you can't rely on everyone watching all of your super boring panels just to be caught up on stuff like that. You can't rely on everyone watching your behind the scenes videos to know if Adam's death is confirmed. You can't rely on everyone buying the DVDs and watching the commentaries just to understand the mechanics of aura breaking. If you have to go back to explain something, it should be explained in the show too. And unfortunately, there's another problem with Ruby's supplemental material as we can see with the Yang character short for Volume 5. It's a fine little short story. Yang and Ruby are sparring, and they get interrupted by an Ursa attack. It's a cute little scene. Yang has a tendency to act as a mother figure, but on occasion, she and Ruby have more of a sibling rivalry relationship. Seeing the two act like sisters in the short was a nice change of pace, especially hot off the heels of Yang's depression during Volume 4. So, what's the problem? Well, it's better than the show. Volume 5 was a big moment for the girls. Yang and Ruby finally get back together after their journeys. I expected to see the sisters have a big moment together, but it never happened. Yang and Ruby barely spend time talking to each other, and they never address Yang's struggle of losing her arm, or Ruby's reasonings for leaving Yang alone. Yang has a heart-to-heart -heart with Weiss, but it's almost all exposition, and that's the problem. The characters forego their personalities to focus so much on the plot instead. The scripts favor the plot, or exposition, so much that the characters never get to be characters. Their dialogues are devoid of personality. Like, you can see, their mouths are moving, they're saying words, but you could put those words in anyone else's mouths and nothing would change. The big character moment between our two girls shouldn't have been exclusive for only the pre-volume short. It should have been in the show, and that's the biggest problem. I struggle to think of any character-specific lines from all of Volume 5. I can remember Yang moments from Volumes 1 through 4, but Volume 5, all the dialogue is just exposition. Volume 6 was a little better, especially during their time on the Brunswick farm. I really loved the unique character interactions that highlighted their different personalities, but then once I got to Argus, all the dialogue turned to plot, and the setting, and the lore, and blah. I wanted to make this video because I feel like Ruby's characters only have good character moments or interactions when it's in Ruby's supplemental stories. I was so excited talking about the manga, or the mobile game, because the character interactions in the show feel watered down due to having to focus on the plot so much. I would say Miles and Carrie should take a look at the supplemental stories to get a better idea on how to have meaningful character interactions, but the thing is, they do have good character moments, but it's just hidden in the most baffling of places. No! God, please, no! 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 Okay, so, like, some people like Ruby Chibi and they think it's funny or whatever, but not me. I've never liked it. I really try to, but the animation is just fucking ugly. The jokes never land. It's so slow. But I kept seeing these comments talking about how the characters are written way better than Ruby Chibi, and it's true. The kids have interesting conversations with each other. They have unique experiences. Characters with abysmal personalities in the show get to shine in the Chibi form. Characters who get no screen time to develop get to be a highlighted front and center. Characters who literally never talk to each other in the entirety of the show finally get to interact, but it's only ever in Ruby Chibi. They've shown they can give the characters actual character, so I don't understand why it's limited to their comedy spin-off. And like, I get it, Chibi's comedic nature is easier to lend to more dynamic character moments. But just because the show proper is supposed to be dark and mature and super duper edgy now, doesn't negate a character having a personality. And we've seen these kids have more lighthearted moments since the fall of Beacon. They've had fun, they've made jokes. Just because the plot takes over doesn't mean the kids need to forego the things that make them unique. And I don't want them to just say cliché things and turn their unique characters into stereotypes. I just want them to have their individuality even when in serious situations. So with all that said, I want to talk about another supplemental story. Something that has proven these characters can be true to their natures even in plot-heavy scenarios. It shows the versatility of the characters and that the sky is the limit when it comes to the world of Ruby fan art. 
While not something made officially by Rooster Teeth, the fans have made some of the best stories and art for the show. Fan art, fan designed clothes, comics, fan fiction, fan animations, making new characters, expanding on the old ones, telling stories that they didn't tell during the show. Really, the fan works for Ruby are above and beyond. I love some of the amazing things the fans have come up with. And Rooster Teeth clearly thinks so too. An artist named Dishwasher got hired to work for Genlock. A lot of fans get their art put onto merch. Fans of the show are now working on animating it. Rooster Teeth has always been a community-driven company, and seeing them give some love back to the fans is awesome. So, yes, the supplemental stuff is awesome. They tell fun stories, they highlight unique characters, they give insight into the world, they give characters new depth, they give the show new life. And yeah, the show has flaws, but at least it's generating other material that's thoroughly enjoyable, and gives the characters we know and love a great platform to thrive on. And I want to end this video with a suggestion on how to fix that dialogue whenever the plot gets really heavy. Just give the characters an occasional one-liner, something that highlights their personalities, something that helps you remember they are a unique person compared to the people they're standing next to. And to help with this, I'm gonna use one of my favorite forms of fan art. Text posts. I want to be rebellious, but I don't want to get into trouble. My parents thought they were naming me something unique, but really they just signed me up for a life with a misspelled, mispronounced, never finding on a Coke bottle name. I'm actually pretty cool. Just give me like five tries to get it right. Realistically, the space under my bed is very small, so if a monster did in fact live there, it would also have to be very small. It would be some kind of baby monster. I would have to look after it. Have you ever accidentally befriended someone who is very irritating? Being an adult and being happy are two circles that do not overlap in my Venn diagram of life. Stop shaming people who drink milk, you bullies. Our bones may be strong, but our hearts are not. I'm a really affectionate person. Once you get past my five layers of shyness, awkwardness, fear, vague dislike, and loneliness. How am I supposed to follow the law in these Grand Theft Auto games if they don't even give me a turn signal button? Yesterday you said I was the best. No, I said you did your best. There's a huge difference. I hope you enjoyed that video. I really had a lot of fun with it, so I hope you did too. And it's true. Just check out all that supplemental stuff, whether it's the manga, the fan stuff. Links for every fan thing that I talked about shown on screen is in the description, so check them all out. Also, big thanks to the two people who helped me with the voices during the text posts part. Twins Inc. You probably know about her. She has some awesome Ruby reviews and stuff. She has discussion videos, and she just... Really cool, really good critique, gives lots of good insight on the show. Go ahead and check her out. Second one is Allison R.U. She's so amazing. Like, look at her artwork. It's amazing. She's one of my favorite YouTubers, and she has, like, woefully not nearly enough subscribers or views. Check her out. She does these cool things where, like, she'll get a description of a monster, but she doesn't know what it's describing. So she has to, like, draw it blindly to see if, like, it matches up with what it actually looks like. Please just check it out. It's so cool. I want you to see it. If you're liking my channel and you want to want to support me, then go ahead and check out my Patreon. I got lots of fun stuff. You can see videos a day early. You can see a clip of an upcoming video early. One dollar, seven dollars, it doesn't matter. Anything at all helps. I would really love anything and it would make you an awesome person. Alrighty, and if you want to do me a favor, like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.